when people think of cyber attacks, we often think of the really technical, really skilled hackers who are breaking through networks and computer systems. But actually, a lot of attacks, as we've sort of talked about a little bit, are actually a little bit more psychological and involve manipulating humans, which is really what social engineering is. We'll look at a few techniques, but first of all, let's define this term then. So social engineering is the act of manipulating humans so that they give up private information, access to systems, or just their money straight up. So really, the purpose of this um, aspect of cybersecurity is the attackers are exploiting human gullibility as a vulnerability, as a weakness. So gullibility being uh, falling for things and falling for tricks and so on, believing people who are lying and so on. These are things which attackers can manipulate to gain access to systems or info or money. So mostly this relies on psychological skills, but they certainly may be used in a more technical attack. For instance, maybe an attacker uses social engineering to gain access to or send an email to a victim and the email has got a link to download a malware or some malware. That's The malware itself is a technical attack, but it, the actual method to get it to the victim is a social engineering technique. So these attacks often involve two main things. They involve usually some blagging and also some impersonation. So blagging is really lying, coming up with some fake scenario to trick somebody, and impersonation is similar, but impersonating is where you are pretending to be somebody else who you are not. So for instance, an example of this type of attack, which uses both of these things, is maybe the first stage is to have a fake website, which is claiming that a computer is infected. It's actually not, it's actually fine. It's just an advert and it's trying to trick people. Hopefully a human is gullible enough to fall for it and call the phone number on the page, calling supposedly tech support. And we speak to a person who pretends to be working for usually a company like Microsoft or Apple or Amazon. They're not, of course, they are an attacker. And they might impersonate a real support worker who is trying to help the victim, but actually trying to get access to their money or some other information. The first of a few techniques we'll look at now is phishing, a really, really common type of social engineering. This is where the attacker is disguising themselves as a trustworthy person or organization to try and obtain personal information from a victim. So they are usually impersonating somebody else, somebody trusted or somebody interesting at least. The classic example is where you get an email saying somebody's died, some famous celebrity or some king or queen has died and they're leaving you money. It can be that sort of impersonation, not just your bank or the government, but it often is that too. So phishing can be done over email, texting or calling. I think phishing emails are the most well known. And nowadays we're starting to see it a lot more in comment sections on Instagram, say, or YouTube, you will see comments obviously left by a bot with a link and they're trying to trick you into clicking it and maybe accessing a form to put in your password or download some malware, that sort of thing. And what's important to know about phishing is the attacker is not targeting one person individually. They're giving it to, they're sending out these messages or calls or texts to thousands, if not millions of people. And from the attacker's perspective, all they need is one person to be hooked for the attack to have worked. They are expecting most people to ignore it or not fall for it, but it only needs one or two or a few people to fall for it to get their money or get the information. So that hooking is why phishing, albeit spelled differently, is named after the normal phishing, where you are phishing for fish, as in you've got some bait, which is this trusted email or email coming from a trusted person, and hopefully somebody falls for the bait and gets caught. So a fairly, fairly regular exam question is giving you an example of a phishing email and asking you to give indicators which could inform somebody that it is actually a phishing attempt and isn't legitimate. So here's an example coming from a university. Actually, it's just a phishing attempt. So the first thing which is really common in all phishing attempts, not only over email, also over calls or messages, is a sense of urgency. They're not saying, okay, I want you to give information in a year's time. They're saying, okay, it needs to be done now. In 24 hours, it's urgent. Otherwise, the victim doesn't panic and doesn't give up information quickly. Also, because this attacker is not emailing you in particular, they're emailing potentially millions of other people. The greeting is not personalized. It doesn't say your name or information about you. It's always generic because they don't know who you are. They're just doing it to a random person. And the way these attacks usually work is a link takes you to another website and you download something or put in some information, that sort of thing. But usually the link or often the link is false. 
especially in an email, the attacker is able to change the link text to look like it's going to a legitimate website, but actually the link underneath might be going to a completely different website. And so you can see if there's a false link by hovering over it, and it should show you the actual true address it will take you to. Another warning sign is where it's asking for things only you should know. So here the scenario, the blagging scenario is your password is going to expire and it's asking for your password via this link, which only you should know. Your university shouldn't be asking for it and so that's suspicious. And finally, often these messages calls emails will have fairly poor grammar, fairly poor spelling, often because the attacker is not even in your country, maybe doesn't speak English natively. And so um, it's suspicious because your bank or your university or the government should be able to spell words correctly and have good spelling, punctuation, grammar, but often the attacker doesn't. So I'm sure a lot of you would not fall for phishing attempts, which are obvious, but thinking about generally, if, you have, if you're have, if you running a company, it's important you are training your staff to be able to spot these sort of things to try and prevent phishing occurring. Also, installing good filters to try and filter out potential phishing emails, etc., etc. These are all good ways to stop this happening or trying to reduce the risk. Farming is the second technique, which is very much linked to phishing. Often that link takes you to a farming website. So farming is where the attacker is creating a fake website, which is impersonating a trusted one. So it's often your bank or the government or PayPal. PayPal is a service where you can send money around. Therefore, it's a, a common uh, a target for attackers to impersonate. So we might just copy the website code or try and make it look very, very similar to a real website. You can sometimes spot that the link at the top is different. It may be a misspelling of the actual website's name or something like this. But the point being, this website is either trying to get you to download malware, but more commonly will have a logon or a form to put in bank details. You're trying to get the victim to put in their details. And of course it goes to the attacker, it doesn't go to the actual website. I mentioned that often the address at the top is just slightly different and can be really obvious if you spot that. But there are some more sophisticated farming attacks which can actually redirect the victim from the legitimate website. So the victim goes to paypal.com, which is our proper website, but actually without the victim knowing, it's actually going to a fake farming website, which is quite a scary thought. This can happen because malware is installed on the computer. It can also happen because the attacker is very advanced and can manage to change a server somewhere. So these are harder to um, prevent. But certainly, again, training is really important and also having up-to-date anti-malware software is important too. And the final technical look at for now, there are many more actually for social engineering. All of them are fairly similar. This one is quite nice because it's quite simple, shoulder surfing. It actually is what it sounds like it is, which is directly observing a person entering their private information, often just by looking over their shoulder. So shoulder surfing in that way. You know, I'm sure you've seen people enter their passwords, Sometimes it's quite easy to spot this sort of thing. People are not always very private about it. So for example, putting into a password into their computer, putting their pin number into an ATM or in a card reader. If you are looking for it, you can spot it. And there are people who are trying to do this. My favorite example though is this example of Kanye West, who is an American rapper. He met President Trump in the White, office, in the White House. And he's in front of, I don't know, <laughs> hundreds, it seems like hundreds of cameras and a camera behind him. And you can see when he's opening his phone, he's putting in his very secure password, which is all zeros. So we are effectively shoulder surfing Kanye West here and seeing him enter his private information. Terrible password, but it, it demonstrates a point that it's quite easy to spot these sort of things. And as a victim or as someone who could be a victim, it's important you are obviously checking around you for cameras in his case, or just people who can see what you're doing, maybe cover your pin number, cover your password if you can, to try and avoid being shoulder surfed.